inspire. Welcome back to Starting Now. I'm your host, Jeff Saris. This is the show where I talk to entrepreneurs and creatives of all types to reveal the unexpected paths to where they are today. This week is a sponsored episode. Everything about it's the same, but um, essentially I just want to let you know up front that this episode is sponsored by Richie, my guest, and his Chef Boyer Doge project. So be sure to check out the description below for the links and everything you need to check it out. Um, But this is just like any other episode. So we dive into Richie's origin story and we talk about TikTok and social media and all of the things that he's been able to build, which he has a substantial TikTok following, um, but all the things he's been able to build along his journey to creating his NFT project. So without further ado, my conversation with Richie from Chef Boyard Doge. I have a one-on-one project that kind of flourished into a gender project after talking to crypto safety because I was making one dog at a time. And I was like, man, this is so slow. I was like, how are these people doing this? And then I asked Stacy and then she said, oh, you need coders. So then I like found a guy off like a Google uh, Medium article and I checked him out and they were, uh, they're called genderedmfts.io and they had done some other projects and they were like graphic designers who segued into nfts because they were like wow this space is just more booming than their web development stuff so they like dropped all that stuff gave their clients to other clients and then i uh started with them probably like four months ago and i started my dog seven months ago and it's pretty much i just like i'm a cook in real life but i I went to art and design school so i wanted to mesh together cooking and dogs because i really like dogs because i was trying to think of some sort of like what like what i enjoy drawing a lot and i was like oh i've always drawn animals uh, kind of like anthropomorphized the uh, like i've always drawn cats and dogs and like with human in suits and stuff i don't know why like since i was a kid so i was like thinking i was like chef and i was like dog and i was like good boy maybe and i was like chef boy or doge and i was like oh that's actually kind of catchy and i made the twitter and i remember uh i told sam like by the time i found out that she had um the like Stacy thing going, I was actually already following her on Twitter annoyingly, oh, and then funny. I saw her uh, posting about cool cats on um on Facebook, and I was like, "Yo, are you are you into this shit?" Like I was like, "Here's my uh, chef Doge." I think I had like 300 followers or something. Where like now I have like 17.7k. So it's like it was for like a six month journey. Like it's like the followers have blown up like a lot. But like back then, she was like, "Oh my God, I'm Stacy," and I think she had like already like three or four thousand. I was like, "Oh, the shit, your page is huge!" <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. Crazy like, how much, yeah, like the space has changed. Like having like it's still having over 10k followers and like NFT land seems like whoa, like where did all these followers come from? Uh huh. Like well, the you, engagement was huge. Yeah, and you've uh, you seem to be a master of building that following on different platforms because like we'll dive into everything, but your uh, TikTok alone is. It, it's blown up, hasn't it? Yeah, like the TikTok is at 104,000 uh, followers. But, and then I think I have like, I have 6.2 million likes now. Yeah. But like the, the crazy part is the views, man. Like I have over 100 million views. Where like, I've seen some pages have a million followers with like 20 million views. Depends on like the engagement, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. uh, girls singing and dancing are going to get more followers than, you know, a random dude cooking food in his house or whatever. But <laughs> just the amount of engagement man it would be like i had this one video that had over 22 million views and in the songs you can like see the kind of like chronological order of who has the most likes or who has the most views and there was like it was a song by willa smith will smith's daughter and it was like 350,000 videos and the only ones that were in front of me were like Charlie D'Amelio and like Addison Ray. It was like chicks like who have like five billion likes. And I was like, Kate, what's going on here? That's when I was like, Kate, what is going on? Like I was just doing little videos of me cooking and then just like it just started to pop off. And like I kind of like have like kept that momentum and like the Twitter sphere. That's why like whenever someone's like, Well, you have seventeen thousand followers, like are you still? And I'm like, ah, my TikTok is a hundred. I was like, I'll be happy when it's like fifty or something. But uh-huh. you know, like my fiance's brother has like two million he's the one who like got me into it he was just like i was like oh that's for karaoke like whatever dude and he was just like nah man he's like a jeweler and he was like just do your hobby on it and like something you're passionate about and just post every day and that's like it just that kind of like gave me the framework after i like also read a gary v book to just like 
keep posting and doing what you love and your shit will grow. You know, I mean, people will be able to tell you're like authentic and you like what you're doing. And then when shit's not so hot and maybe you have a bad day, it's like you like what you're doing anyways. So it doesn't hurt that you're posting if the video gets no views or you don't make any sales that day. Cause you're like, wow, I just drew an awesome picture that I enjoyed. Or I did like a, I made some food I enjoyed where like, you know, if you don't like what you're doing, you're not going to be able to like persevere through the times when like, you're not making any progress. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And would you say there were any sort of uh, tricks or things that you sort of put into place that you found as you were building your TikTok? Because that is like, that's an amazing following and so much engagement with uh, the content. Yeah. I found just like, at first I would literally get like one view, two view, five views, like one like, and I was like, I was doing these long duration videos and I talked to the guy with uh, two male followers and he just said, you either need to do long videos that are like you have dialogue in them and people watch the whole thing or you have to have really short snippets and like before i used to have like maybe in the middle like with no dialogue like 30 second videos of me i'd like have 20 different clips of videos like i'm blending a sauce and then i'm making a reduction and then i'm cutting some sort of fish and then i'm doing all this plating and then i was like he's like dude just simplify it like find your niche and i was just cooking i was like i just tried putting a video of cooking fish in a pan and i was like no just like cook put the fish in pan, whatever and then like i didn't even know what asmr was and just everyone in the comments was like yo turn off the music like that sound was awesome and i was like i don't know what these people are talking about like whatever and then i looked it out later and i was like oh asmr and i was like oh that's kind of cool and so i just like started taking off the mo like the audio like the music side and then like boosting just the normal volume i like bought a little mic or whatever that i plugged <laughs> into my iphone and i started just like doing like small videos of me uh the ones that really started going crazy was just me candying fruit it's like a a chinese uh fruit that like it's called hawthorn berries and pretty much this like thing called tong hulu they would just reduce like water and sugar down to like a simple syrup and then you almost turn it into like a light caramel and then you coat it and then they used to have these hawthorn berries that they would coat in sugar for like kids with cold like thousands of years ago but in the like chinese uh like markets it became like kind of like a delicacy like a little street candy or like they would put it on a long skewer and then eventually they started like branching out into different fruits so i kind of like just found that one niche and i would do these eight second videos that would like have like sometimes like more than 100 percent watch time it would be like an eight second uh -huh. video and the average watch time is 10 seconds because like 70 percent of people are watching it like more than once and it would be like it suddenly would be like a hundred thousand two hundred thousand i'd like refresh and I'd be like oh my god and i'd just be like a million Two million and like sometimes i was like got like 10 million views in like a day and i would just be like man what is going on and everyone like at first they're like making fun of me like oh what are you doing like recording you're eating food and all this stuff like people and I was in like, your I don't know, personal man. life kind of thing yeah yeah, yeah. and some people just thought it was silly some people were like yo keep doing it or whatever right uh and that's once they saw the views and stuff but uh like i think it was just like i just had the consistency where like all my kitchen dudes thought it was cool and i would show them and they're like oh yo that's pretty sweet and like a lot of the time with the cooking, I'd be like trying something adventurous, like, oh, I'm going to steam octopus tonight, or I'm going to try to do like a butcher a new kind of seafood, like razor clams or something. But eventually, like once I found out that the candy fruit was like, I was enjoying it. And like, I just started just like canning fruit just like nonstop. And that's just like all I've been doing for like six months now. It's just like, <laughs> now I'm just like, oh, hey, that's the Tom Hulu guy. And like, it's kind of like blew my mind where I didn't realize how big it was. So like a friend of mine, I hadn't talked to in a while like just saw my videos when I don't even like have him followed and he lives in like a different city. You're just in Vancouver. He's like, yo dude, like I saw you on TikTok, bro. And I was, he's like, is that you? And I was like, no way, man. And we kind of like, it like brought us together again when we'd been friends for like so long. And it's funny. Cause like now we like talk about like NFTs and stuff like every day and we're really close again. So it was kind of like nice that there was a lot of like friends that I um, hadn't talked to in a while that are like, actually engaged and i think like the thing that like sets tiktok and twitter apart from you know the other platforms is that people are actually there you know like it's not just bots like i'll have like twenty thousand comments that are like 80 percent of my people are from girls in the u.s and they're just always like oh that looks awesome and it's like super trivial it'll be like a string of like 40 people talking they're like yo let's make that and then like they'll comment a week later like hey we had a sleepover and we made that and it was so delicious like thank you and it's like whoa it's like super trippy because like <laughs> it like starts like a, a butterfly effect of like all these people that you know want to try the same trend or try the same food and i thought that was like 
really cool when you know same thing with like twitter where you can tell people to post their art and like you know you're getting like 600 comments and you're checking all this art and you're like wow like there's actually so many people here where like you post on instagram and it's just like dm for promotion take uh-huh. this dm for that it's like i'm like dude everyone's boss here like what happened to instagram yeah. sucks or yeah. like TikTok and Twitter is like, wow, this is like so authentic. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really feels like Instagram has sort of fallen off a cliff of sorts. Like it's it's fine. Like there's still the images and everything, but it just it doesn't feel the same as it once did, which is sort of the life cycle of all the social media platforms. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was just kind of weird. Yeah. So with with Twitter, well, we'll dive into all this stuff. I want to rewind first. So who is Richie? Like, who were you growing up? Were you always, uh, is there a point when you found yourself drawn to art? Because you have this interesting combo of the art and the, like, cooking and being a chef. And Or, um, you are a chef, correct? Or is it a, a yeah. terminology-wise? Yeah, okay. no, I'm a chef. Yeah. Um, well, like, technically, I'm, like, I'm, like, a tournant, which is, like, kind of, like, below CDP, which would be, like, chef de partie. So, I'm, like, I'm the guy who swings around to all the stations. So I'm like not quite a sous chef and like just below junior sous chef. So it's kind of like, I know Saucier, I know all the stations. I just like go around. I work like a 9 a.m. till 9 p.m. shift and like just help whatever station needs help. Or if there's like no station that day, I'll work that one or something. Um, but as for my childhood background, um, so my mom and dad are both chefs. The reason my parents met is my mom is from Canada. They were born in Saskatchewan and my dad is from New York. So what happened was my dad had like, I think he was living in California at the time and he had a job opportunity in Calgary where they said, hey, do you want to be a chef at the Calgary Tower? And he said, I can't afford it. And they just handed him a big envelope of money and they said, is this enough? And he said it was like $3,000, like, you know, like 35 years ago or something. (laughs) He said back then he was like, holy shit. So he's just like, all right. Like, so he moved to Calgary. Uh, and he was working at the top of the Calgary Tower. It's kind of like how, like, uh, the Seattle Tower would be, just, like, less pretty. <laughs> it's more of, like, a concrete tower. But, it's you know, it's, like, kind of, like, the needle shapes and all that. Uh-huh. Um, so then he met my mom, and they were both cooks. And then uh, when I grew up, they ended up being divorced. And then I still saw my dad um, on weekends and stuff. But I was always, like, kind of, like, a doodler and stuff. And I was kind of, like, a space cadet where, like, Later on, the doctor would be like, you're super ADHD, you need to take Adderall or whatever. But I didn't do that till like college. So like, I ended up like, kind of like, finding weird coping mechanisms where I'd be like listening to music. And, you know, while studying or watching something while studying or like falling asleep with the TV and the lights on so I could fall asleep, like weird stuff. And like, when I was a kid, like, ADHD is like better understood now. But like, let's say 20 years ago, like they just thought I was slow or something. They were like, yeah. you know, what's wrong with this kid? Like, he like, you know, doesn't, I just like lift my hand and just like, I don't know what they're blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I mean, just like start blabbing and they would just put me out in the hall. So like they would put me out in the hall with these paper and I would just doodle. Cause I was like, man, like I have nothing to do. So like, that's kind of like what started like in elementary. I just like started drawing cause I was just like out in the hall literally for like six years. And then like, I like, my marks are like really bad in elementary and then junior high, they were like a little better. I was doing good in art class. I was like, Oh, Hey, like art class is fun. Um, and, but I did home ec too. And I was like, Oh, like cooking is fun too. And I kind of like, I had one side of my family be like, yo, you got to be a cook. It's in your blood, blah, blah, blah. And then another people be like, Oh, he's a natural artist. He's got to be an artist. Da, da, da. So then as I got older, my one cousin who went to college, um, she, went to ACAD, which is now like University of the Arts. So they sw- switched from a college to a university to like be able to get more funding from the government. But now the classes are like three hours where we used to have six hour classes. It was crazy. Oh, wow. So like we had a three hour, like three hour block, a two hour lunch, and then a three hour block. So we would do like 40 hours of school a week. And then I would do like 30 hours of work and then like 30 hours of homework. So it was like a hundred hour weeks. And like, um, and then, like, for another part of, like, who I am, I'm, like, kind of, like, one of those guys who's done everything. Like, as a kid, like, I did gymnastics, I skateboard, I did kickboxing. I was, like, really fit for a while. I was into, like, the personal training, getting personal trained. And, like, I did, like, you know, I did, like, one model photo shoot. Like, I was trying everything, you know? Like, always bouncing around trying to figure out what was good for me. Um, but, like, one thing when I was a kid that I totally remember is, like, I always liked inventing stuff where 
where like I wanted to be a pilot and then I found out I was colorblind, so I couldn't be a pilot. Uh-huh. And it was like I would always be drawing and people would say, Cole, your grass is dead. And I'd be like, What do you mean? And like I was just using brown a brown marker and I was like, Oh my god. But then like I was like, I like art anyway, so I don't care. Um but like I would always, you know, take apart like electronics and build little, you know, electronic cars and I built like a little wagon with like portable wheels that had a light on it and I would like make like pipe cleaner crafts as a kid and then like sit in the front lawn and be like pretend I'm a merchant in Zelda and like try to sell people <laughs> stuff on the street. But I didn't tell anyone that I was selling anything, so no one bought anything. <laughs> so um, you just sat there but, you know, all decked always, out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I was always kind of like the lemonade stand kid. I like I collected Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. I still play Magic the Gathering. Um, I had a fly route. Like I would take my sister's fly route back when it was like manually sorting papers. And I was like 10. We'd like make like 70 bucks a month. And I was like so empowering. I was like, I'm rich. I was like a million <laughs> five cent candies and buying N64 games and stuff. So I was always working. And then I like, like while I was going to school, I kind of like started in kitchens as a dishwasher and then moved my way up. And then, like, I was working uh, the whole way through in kitchens as I went to college. And then when I got out of college, um, just, like, Alberta, like, I think they had, like, the lowest unemployment since, like, the Depression. And this was before COVID. It was just, like, because oil was just, like, tanking or whatever. And, like, I was just applying for jobs. And just, like, I was pretty good in my class. But it was, like, kind of a situation where I was, like, there's still jobs. But it was, like, those ad agencies that were 100 people are now, like, five people. And I'm, like, not quite there. And uh, I was, like, kind of debating whether to keep cooking or not or whatever because my parents were just like, oh, don't you, they were telling me, like, you don't want to get stuck in this industry forever, just the hour stuck. And then pay's not that good. They're like, but if you love it, whatever. Yeah. So I was just, like, I started getting into finance um, just, like, to try and make some money on the side. So, like, for the past, like, five or six years, I've been, like, trading stocks and options and crypto and stuff so like i was already in the zone and when you say like, uh, dating into finance do you mean personally or like sort of job wise um well i was like thinking about it but i was kind of like at the same time where i was like i never really fit in to like the office kind of groups like the advertising kids like i would always like i go to good mark and the solo project but they put me together with like you know two other people and i'm like bumping heads with this other guy <laughs> and then you know these other people are like just like not the type of people that I was like wanting to work with forever. And like, you know, and it was like kind of shitty because like the kids in illustration, were, like, like Sam, like were those kind of people that I was like, man, like, I was like, I just wish I was better at illustration because these people are so cool. Um, but I was always kind of in the headspace. Like I just wanted to work alone or with like a small team of like, you know, people who had like mutual respect for each other and stuff like that. Um, but I kind of just like, I kept cooking. I was listening to this like audiobook a long time ago. It was like Anthony Bourdain's uh, Kitchen Confidential or whatever. Uh-huh. And like, and like his, the whole like idea of like being like a pirate and like kind of like exploring the avant garde and stuff. And like, even though I took a break from like art, cause I kind of like stopped drawing for a while, it was like, I never stopped creating. I was like, it just turned to like a new medium where I was like, oh, like, can I create this new dish? I want to hone my knife skills. And it became more about like a craft. And then on top of that, I was like super into finance, like trading and stuff. You know, I would take like online courses and I would, you know, study and like, I think I listened to like 70 books on Audible, you know what I mean? (laughs) Just like nonstop. Um, And I like the independence it gave me and like making money, but like, it was still kind of like, it lacked the creativity that cooking had that made me feel good. But it also required like deeper pockets, which I didn't like really have when I was like paying off student loans. So then like, when the whole NFTs thing came around, I was just like, I was like, no way. It was like the shit that I dreamed of when I finished school. I was like, I wish I could just create whatever I wanted and work alone, but it's so <laughs> impractical. Like you can't do that. You know what I mean? It's like when your parents say like, oh yeah, that's like, that's not a real thing. You know, you can't actually do that, you know? And it was like, kind of like wanting to be a rock star or something, you know? And it was just like, it came to the point where when I discovered like NFTs, I didn't even know what they were. Like it was like four years ago, I had a crypto kitties account and I didn't even know what the fucking NFT was. I was just like, <laughs> okay, well, what do I do with this? And I was just like, I don't know. I just like turned out the thing. I think I lost the password. I found like a piece of paper. Like, I don't even know if I have cats or whatever. I was like, I don't know. Yeah. Cause I was looking at some like traders on Twitter who had cats and I was like, Oh, that's cool. And then I was like surfing Twitter. I think no, I was either surfing Twitter or, or surfing at that TikTok. Time. At that time, had you gone in on Bitcoin or, I mean, Ethereum, that's actually 
yeah very very early for ethereum um, time i think i had like ethereum when it was like under a hundred dollars uh-huh. like <laughs> but i sold it like i i had like i found some crumbs this year of like i had sold like i think i had like over three hundred thousand in dogecoin oh wow. and i just like only and i sold it for like a couple hundred bucks into like litecoin or something i was like oh man look at that, like the history or whatever and like but i still had 20 grand about dogecoin from like 400 bucks so i was just like whatever that was like something that i bought later after i sold that stuff that had really really low mm-hmm. um so like i was like whatever i paid off some credit cards and during covid like i had been working and going to school for like literally like five years and then i had a couple years off where i was working two jobs and i had like no creative time to my like self and then like covid just like forced me into everything like so i literally just got laid off from both my jobs like suddenly and i was like oh man like what the hell am i gonna do right yeah. and like the government like you know we're giving some funding but it was like barely enough to get by um and like that's when i like kind of had like a whole renaissance where i started i started the tiktok my trading started popping off better than it ever done i started like drawing again um i started up this whole um nft stuff and like it was kind of like i had always been a collector as a kid uh, like you know of all the cards so like when i got into the generative project i was like man like to be able to like have the feeling like i have my own card game with like built-in scarcity but then also like get to be an artist and then i was like integrating the cooking i love and i was just like holy shit people were like dude you're like so into this it was like all you're talking about lately and i was just like i'm telling you man i'm the dog man and they're just like i'm crazy yeah you know I mean? isn't that funny and like then, that's yeah. everyone around us i think feels that same way that just like could, could you just not talk about nfts like for an hour <laughs> but it's just it's so exciting so much is yeah. happening and there's so much movement in the space and, and opportunity it's it's just it's unprecedented really yeah and i, I really found like the tiktok and the nft specifically like i found the trading to be like empowering when you made money but like when you're not making money trading you have like a really like low when you're like oh you lose money you like can screw up your life and stuff where like the nfts is like you're creating value out of thin air so it's just like you can create utility or beauty from like your artistic prowess and with tiktok it's like i know how to cook i have a camera i go buy some food supplies and like i can make a i can make a multi-million hit viral video in 20 minutes you know and so like it was like super empowering where like i was kind of like you know after school i was like did i should i go back to school for like a master's in business like they offered me to do a master's in architecture i was like you know i was like what do i want to do i was kind of like i wasn't lost but i was just like man the economy's crappy i met my fiance uh who was like at the restaurant like maybe five years ago and like the only real like business stuff that like jobs that were available were like in the u.s you know what i mean and they would be like oh you want to come do contract work in california for like a couple weeks and you'd probably like have to live in a car you know what i mean so i was just like i was like man like i don't want to leave this lady that i really like and um it, you know we're still together now so it was just like kind of like a weird situation where like um i just like that's why i got into training because i was like i got to figure out something on the internet or whatever right so like then when nfts came around i was like wow this is even better because it's like I don't necessarily need a ton of capital to create stuff like for the general project was different. So I had to get like investors to like, that were my Bitcoin mining friends to like give me money so I could pay the devs to make it. But like, you know, once it's made, it's made, you know, and then like mm-hmm. the overheads all dealt with. Um, so yeah, I wanted to dive like, into that a little bit too. Like sort yeah. of the process of going from um, the one of one uh, like illustrations that you were doing over to uh, generative. Um, but but first, I mean, I wanted to also just say, so the painting, I know it's a while back, but um, with the painting, that was something that um, you just naturally were drawn to, did you find? Like at such a young age that you were painting, like your set of acrylics and everything. Um, yeah, I just, I had this like really killer art teacher in junior high and then in high school who like really like nourished me and like, they were like, oh, cool, you're kind of like an airhead or whatever <laughs> and like a daydreamer, but they were like, they really like um they said i was like very optimistic very like upbeat there was like the kind of guy like no matter what happens they were like man you can't like keep this guy down he's just always like so positive you know what i mean and i was just like super stoked that they were like nourished me and they taught me how to acrylic paint and i got super super into like i like go paul gogan like my favorite but you know like paul gogan and van gogh they lived together and i would like i checked out all that art in like a big art book when they like were in a house together just drawing and painting and i was like holy shit i was like these guys are sick and then 
you know, going into art history and like learning all about them. And then like, I went to a museum in Chicago that had like one of the biggest impressions collections in the world. And I was just like, Oh, so is that the art? So one day I would like to paint. Yeah. I think it was in Chicago. I think it was Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. It was, that's where I it was like, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I was sick, man. I was like, <laughs> dude, I was visiting family and I was like, bomb. Um, but it was the kind of like situation where I was just like, I would love to paint. But I just like I live in an apartment. I don't have like a painting studio. It's messy. I have dogs. They're going to the paint die. So like, I took some time off from drawing, and I was using an old uh, Wacom tablet. And it was funny. Like I had like a teacher say like, "Hey, like he was just watching me draw, and I was I was drawing like with my left hand on like a stylus, and then I'm working with my right hand with the mouse." And he's just like, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "What do you mean?" And he's like, are you left-handed? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, why don't you have a left-handed mouth? And I was like, I don't know. And I didn't know that wasn't normal. And he just said, like, in 20 years of teaching, I've never seen that or whatever. And, like, um, it's funny because, like, my mom got, like, whipped by the nuns when she was younger and she was left-handed. So she's ambidextrous. Oh. And as a kid, I just always use both hands. Like, I, I'm, not perf- I'm not as good as her. Like, she can write perfect with both hands where, like, my writing and my knife skills with my right hand are worse. But, like, in school, just from lack of equipment, I always use like the right-handed, you know, whatever sports equipment. I don't know whether it be like hockey or, or the baseball, or I don't know, you know, like that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And then, um, you know, I've used like a left-handed mouse, like scissors. I can't even cut paper. Like when I try to cut paper with the left hand, it just folds. I'm like, I just use a scalpel <laughs> for everything. Um, so like I had like a really interesting workflow where I was talking to Chris Wall from the Punks comic and I said like, hey, I'm using this like outdated um walk come tablet with this old mac and i i tried to like use my ipad he said try procreate and i like was doing color dropping on procreate and i was like holy shit i like color drop this thing in like 20 minutes where like you would color drop and it's like some sort of like algo like fixes the little edges for you or something (laughs) where like on photoshop it's ridiculous it's like you know i could be fixing the edges of every single little piece for like hours yeah so like suddenly i went from the tablet uh, from the Wacom tablet to like my iPad on Procreate it got a lot better, but like I was still having like problems with line work when I was using a, I had like a super cheap, like, like a Walmart stylus. It was like uh-huh. the cheapest thing. I'm like the batteries die. And like, I'm like, I brought the uh, iPad to um, Apple saying like, Hey, can I get an Apple pencil for this? And they were like, they just looked at it like it was a fossil, man. They were just like, Oh, you still have this old model. They're like, Oh God, this thing still works. And they were like, and I'm like, oh, can I just like put the pencil on it? They're like, it actually has no magnetic charging strip. So you have to use only battery operated styluses. I go to the other store. He's like, yo, these are the same technology. It's not incompatible. So like you have to get a new iPad. And I was like, fuck. So then, like, I, the Chris Wall guy I talked to, I was like, is it worth it? And he just said, dude, if you get like that iPad Pro, the 2021 and the stylus, he's like, people like, I'm trying to think of what the words are, but there's these ones that are like 3,500 bucks and there's like these big glass screens and the guys are drawn. Uh-huh. Sometimes they're like more than that. And he said, people are like ditching those for like a one grand iPad Pro. That's and they're amazing. like, Apple He's like, just get it. Just get it, dude. And I was like, all right, all right. And like my dogs went from being like kind of shitty to like they're getting better. And then like I got the iPad Pro when like, because I tried to do some of the generative work with the old stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm in over my head. And I was like, because I told the dude, I was like, how many traits could we have he's like yeah sometimes people have five or six traits and like how many variations he's like maybe like 100 150 and i was like how about 250 variations oh, and like i wanted like 14 traits and he's just like he's like you're the only artist he's like yeah he's like it probably won't happen and i was just like i got the pencil and i went from being like i'm in over my head and i can't do this so like i was just like Ugh. like i was just like 16 hours straight just like hammer it out um but it was awesome man it was like the whole process behind the dogs where initially I just like had a dog with like a human body and then it would have like let's say a knife maybe another tool and then a hat and then a chef jacket so it started like pretty simplistic on my Mm one-on-one and then I was just having trouble drawing them where I was just like I was drawing a different dog and I had like this system where I still have it in place where I draw one of one dogs and there's only ever one of each purebred so like sometimes someone like some guys like hey like can you do me a Doberman and he was pissed because I'm just like, sorry, the Doberman's <laughs> taken. And he's like, what do you mean it's taken? I was like, it's like, I'm only doing one of each pure red. And I was like, I could do like a Doberman cross with something. And like, so then I was like, oh, this is kind of limiting. Like, I still am like for custom one-on-ones do 
that but like for my general project i was like i was like man i really want to go all out and have so much variation and i was like i had different um so i like the hat the eyebrows the eyes there's a tool in the left hand a tool in the right hand there's embroidery on the stitching of the jacket there's the jacket there's aprons there's the necklaces then like there's a coat there's a background and it was really hard because like the arms are crossed like this mm -hmm. and the uh, the coat is actually the same layer as the head so like where it was so hard because i was like how am i going to implement this like and make it generative right so i had to like find all these weird kind of loopholes where it's like the apron and the uh where the hands are and the jacket are actually like cut out and like where the um that handle of the blade is there's actually no handle of the blade underneath so it's just like because the blade is on top of the layer of the uh the coat and stuff so it was like trying to learn to do all these things like thank god i had jim's help from the from the dev team because he was just like he's like you need to have a rarity table it was like all this stuff that was more like a video game i wasn't like ready for i was like rarity table and he's like he's like yeah like a loot table like you gotta everything's gotta be organized man everything's gotta be alphabetical everything's gotta be in folders and i'm just like using the messiest worker and i just don't know where my layers are and stuff um so that was like really hard for me to like organize but like once i had the rarity table i actually set the rarity table first just so I like had an idea. I like, I know about the kitchen brigade system in the kitchen. So I set up a kitchen brigade system based on rarity of like their ranking uh, for the embroidery. I like found different Japanese blacksmiths that I'm really into and different like Japanese folded steel or carbon steel and different like German knives, like Henkels and stuff that like I actually use at work and different tools that like all my cooks, I asked them, Hey, what's your favorite tool? I'm like, well, uh, one of my, uh, like buddies is like oh i love the teppanyaki tool it's like a little scraper when you're like at the kind of like those uh ones where they got the flat top and they're setting everything on fire you know and they're doing uh -huh. like the shows with the onions and the eggs or whatever um you know so it was like stuff like that where like i was getting everyone's like input into like what tools they wanted in the kitchen so it's kind of like a really like immersive process with all my cook friends and i had a lot of fun like oh hey should i have like the chef cap or the bouffant cap or hey should i have the backwards like duck bill or like the traditional little cap that's checkered. And like, I ended up um, like trying to make it more realistic where it's like actually things a cook would wear. Cause I just noticed everyone's just like doing wizard hats and shit. <laughs> and I was like, man, everyone's just changing the animal and putting the same hat on them. Mm -hmm. And like, sometimes it's like, they're even like copying the actual like drawing and just changing clothes. And I was just like, man, like, I was like, maybe my project would be like an instant sellout if they were all monkeys. But I was like, I don't draw monkeys. I draw dogs. You yeah. know what I mean? So it was just like, I'm not going to do something I don't enjoy for the short term game when in the long term game, if I'm not passionate about it, I probably would end up like stop working on the roadmap or something. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So it's like, yeah, it's it what ended you said up earlier. coming together really nice. Yeah, it's what you said earlier. It's so important to be find, find the thing that you will uh, continue on because you already love it. So no matter what's like happening, you already love doing this. Like you already love cooking on TikTok. Like you already love cooking, you put it on TikTok. You already love drawing the dogs, you put it on and as NFTs. So it's the perfect kind of uh, system because you keep going and you keep like promoting and reaching out and connecting with new people. And then over time, things just sort of snowball together. And it just, yeah, it just happens with time. I wanted to ask about the developer relationship, like um, how sort of how that worked out and how you uh, work the arrangement if you had to do like an upfront cost or sort of how that works from the artist side. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Dude, it was like, thank God I found this guy in Google because like when I was first searching, like Stacy was like, yeah, just like look in some groups or whatever or check Discord and like everything just seems so dodgy. It's like, oh, we're uh, three anonymous guys from some <laughs> like Turkey or something and yeah. sorry, our time zone, it's 4 a.m. right now and it's like, like 10 hours away from you can we have 60 percent? and then they want to know upfront cost and i was just like oh this seems like i'm gonna get rugged i'm just like oh this is sketchy and then like i was looking on google for like generative articles and uh it's funny because jim the uh his original um his original graphic design stuff was called uh, ray web development and he um he was he went to like he's a coder but he went to school he did like writing and stuff i think he has like like some sort of degree in like english literature or something right so he's like He's not like a poet or anything, but like he writes a lot of like, he likes to write books and he writes articles. And I was on Medium reading like how I programmatically generated 10,000 cats or something. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I just, I emailed him asking actually about the other 
offers. And I was like, is this like a good deal? And he's like, no, that's a really bad deal. Like, don't do that or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then I asked like, oh, well, what are your guys' rates? And like, their rates were a lot lower. They were like, they only wanted 20%, but then they wanted like upfront money, which I was like, oh, well, I would love to, you know, I was like, I just don't have that kind of money or whatever. Right. Yeah. So then, um, Could you I told like my friends about it of what that might be like, not exact, but just sort um, of a range for people to know. Like usually like, you know, it'd be like between a couple S and, or four S it depends like on what you're deploying. Right. Mm-hmm. I, and you also have a deployment contract fee that could be anywhere from like 0.3 S to like one S. And then some people I knew that were like launching a game, they were like paying six S, you know what I mean? So it's oh, wow. like, you have to have money to do a general project. And it's just like, they, um, their percentage of like the, uh, initial profits is like, let's say 20%, I get 60%, my investors get 20%, but like I get 100% of royalty. So I was like, yo, this is a super solid deal. It's way better than all the other deals, but I have to like come up with all this Ethereum that I don't have, right? So like I was just talking to my coworkers that are all like Bitcoin miners and I thought I would have to like convince them and they were just like, I'm in. They're like, just like, (laughs) so like, they're like, yo, dude. They're like, our one buddy is just like, it was funny. They were like, dude, they're like, you grew the TikTok do that big man they're like you, you'll be fine you can do it you know what i mean even though like tiktok's like more they don't really like mess with crypto a whole lot like mm-hmm. he just meant i think like more so he was like you have the drive and the consistency to make something work he's like dude i've seen you scale something before yeah he's like and especially when people didn't believe in you and i was like my one buddy who like i was sticking with him the whole time and he used to be making like one dollar mining i'd be like you made a dollar and you know <laughs> now it's just like i go into his house and there's like hundreds of thousands of dollars in computers and he's making like bank and i'm just like i'm like dude you did it man you know and yeah. like he's been doing it for like seven or eight years or something so it's just like there's like a really big emphasis on like if i didn't have those really solid developers and those friends who like believed in me like i wouldn't have had the infrastructure at all like there was three investors the coding team i think sometimes was like up to like six people because they had like you know they get in people um contracted they have like a secretary they have like a workflow manager a ceo they had like another guy coding another guy coding you know i mean so it ended up being like a team of 10 and they were like super chill man like hundreds of emails like i would email them sometimes they'd be like man is this guy even sleep i'd be like emailing them at (laughs) 2 30 and waking up at 6 a.m emailing them again but they were like always super cool sometimes we do phone calls uh sometimes google meets and like it's worth it to have upfront money, honestly, to get a good team. Cause like, if you don't, you're either going to get rugged by someone who's anonymous or, you know, they might end up being dodgy. And what if they just like take your work and generate project value or something? So it's just like, they had like multiple lawyers. They like sent me all these contracts and stuff. I signed it. I had to do NDAs where it's just like, I can talk about the art side and like, you know, how much the project costed and stuff. But it was just like, no showing our secret sauce. You know what yeah. I mean? It was just like, I can't, you know, if they have a Google Meets video, I can't be recording the freaking codes that they're writing for the smart contract deployment and all that stuff. Um, and there is like certain things that are transparent, like on Etherscan, where you can see how many dogs we've reserved, or you could check like, oh, hey, they just airdropped three dogs, or hey, that guy was the owner and he just bought, I like, I bought a dog to do an example video and something like that, right? Uh-huh. But um, these guys, like, I was really lucky where they had done like one project that sold out. And like now I think they've done five that have sold out and two are verified on OpenSea. So they're like solid. I think, I mean, they've done four more projects. I think they've done like 10 projects now. So like they, on their website, they're like, they're trading volume for how much they've sold and all their projects is like almost $8 million. I was like, holy crap. So like, (laughs) like he, he was on the money. Like Jim was like, I checked his Facebook and he just said, I'm quitting like my graphic design business and all these people like, Jim, what are you doing? Like, what's going on? (laughs) He's like, I'm pursuing JPEGs. And I don't think like a lot of people understood or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's a pivot. Like what's, what's great is like, that is a, it's sort of a sidestep. It's not even that big of a leap because that's what we do. Like we do brand development, like web development, design and everything. And like, I've been sort of pursuing sort of a similar avenue to help artists develop their projects because it is such an opportunity for both sides. And like an independent artist like yourself, like you're not going to write a smart contract. You're not going to build all those things. Like there's no reason to, like you have your lane. So yeah, it's really great that you found a team that was excited about it and ready for it and um, able to deliver on it. Um, So now there are challenges, of course, in in selling because everyone's like, oh, you need to sell out right away and like all these things. What are some of the challenges you face so far 
um, since uh, the project has launched? I'd say like just gas fees, man. It'll be like there'll be people who want to buy and then gas is high. And then I'll be like, oh, I didn't sell any for like a bunch of days. And then gas just dropped. And I'm like, whoa, I sold 10 last night. I'm like, what the hell? You know what I mean? So just like, you know, it's like the people who are like 10 this week or something like that. But like, it's like the people who say they're going to buy. Usually it's not that they're lying. They're just like, what the hell? The the, the, the energy cost 270 and it was trying to charge me 250. They're like, I don't want to pay 500 bucks. They want to pay 330 bucks or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, And it's totally understandable. And it's like, the time I paid in advance um, and like Ethereum went up, if I had paid during launch, I would have needed to come up with like another five grand. If I had paid during a different day, day when a gas was high, like one of the teams paid like three more grand, grand in a deployment fees. You know what I mean? So wow. just like if the, if the window had been any different where like I didn't buy Ethereum when it was like 3K and pay, uh, you know, and if it like had gone almost to 5k, it was just like suddenly I'd be like, oh shit, I don't have enough money to do this product. So it was just like, yeah, like I may have launched when gas isn't high and like had like a bunch of like, like FOMO and hype and stuff behind my project. But like, I'm like, it doesn't matter, man. I'm like, I'm a docs dev. We're all transparent devs. I'm not going anywhere. It's like, I have my TikTok. I'm looking at like five, 10 years out. You know what I mean? It's just oh, yeah. like, I'm just like, what kind of empire can I build? Like in the long run, you know? So like, for me, it's like I got the Twitter up to 17,700, the TikTok's at 104,000, the, the Discord's like a, almost 2,000, but it's just like, I was like, do I want, I do I, do I, first of all, I don't have 30 grand to drop on bots or like spam invites and all this yeah. shit, you know, to, to make my project look super cool or whatever. But like, what I have been doing is like, I just say like, post your artwork and get like 600 comments or like, I'll just like, maybe I'll do raffles or, the best thing I've been doing lately is spaces, man. Like, I wish I was doing spaces sooner, honestly. Because, like, I went from, like, you know, not really talking to some people to, like, I was like, is there any other food NFTs to, like, wow, there's this guy named Food Frogs who's, like, super chill. And he's just like, hey, like, let's start doing spaces together. If you're in food, I'm in a food. And, like, we're, like, looking at, like, real world applications for our NFTs as well. So it was just, like, I kept doing it. I kept doing it. And then suddenly it was just, like, oh, hey, there's this guy who's, like, some big chef. And then, like, suddenly it was, like, oh, wow. And it's like, you know, it's Tom Colicio, who's like some guy who's been on The Simpsons, who's like been on the Food Network for like 15 years. And I was like, what the hell? And like suddenly like all these food guys are like, yo, let's let's do some spaces. And then Food Frog wants to like do like a future of NFT spaces where me and him co-host and just like invite like celebrity chefs in that are getting into like the NFT game or, or even just like into the kitchen like realm to kind of like commingle. And I'm like, man, like, if I like hadn't been on spaces, like, I don't know what I would have done for like real organic marketing. Cause it's just like, it, there's just seems like nothing like it, you know, you can pay an influencer and get like fake retweets and likes, but like those are actual like people connecting and bonding and getting trust in there. So I'm just like, I'm just going to be in there like as much as I can. For sure. And it's your, uh, your sort of lane within NFTs. Like you found the like-minded individuals. Like that's so important. Um, for for anyone, like any project or any business, is finding the people that sort of are in your corner that already are interested in this area. So you're bringing in chefs, bringing in all these people. I'm sure the audience already is primed to be interested in cooking and like sort of chef related things. Yeah. And you mentioned um, the real world application. Is there anything you can share about that? Like right now, like what you're sort of considering and um, oh, like I what's can, in the I future? can share it all. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm like my whole roadmap's open. I don't I don't hide anything. So pretty much like what I started with was I wanted to like make sure I was um, inclusive where like I'm giving a lot of value to like NFT people and collectors and then also like catering to people who do like cooking because like not everyone who's a collector cooks obviously right so like like literally all the people I found are just like they're like either like cooking or they're like dogs or they just like my art right so I released a weekly airdrop so I have that's 52 airdrops a year I just airdrop everyone like on Polygon an nft right now i'm doing like a knife collection like kind of silly i did like a candy cane knife and i'm doing trying to make them still like chef knife not like swords so like i did like um i did one that was like it had a doggy bone as a handle you know like silly stuff like that and i just airdropped everyone and then i've been doing a monthly comic where i kind of integrate like a recipe into the comic so it's kind of like a funner way to learn about it like it could almost be like a kid's book or something like my first one i was called a uh, it was like memories of or memoirs of dolphin was. It was like a it's like a scalp fancy scalp potato, and I like kind of like 
had this ratatouille style food critic come in really grumpy into a restaurant and they can't like feed them and make them happy. And then this guy whips up these magical golden potatoes and then they cut them up and slice them and then like garnish them and then put them in the oven, take them out. And then it's kind of like, you like, maybe if you were like a kid, you would unknowingly be reading a comic book and then be like, Oh wow. I just learned how to make scalloped potatoes or whatever. Right. <laughs> so then I was thinking, I was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Like I'd always been thinking about um, on TikTok, like one day having uh, private, you know, like, cooking lessons kind of like master classes with my like local chefs and stuff and then I was just like you know I was talking to food frogs and he was really like opening my eyes up because I was like saying like you know and it was some other people on spaces too where I was like could I ever do a private dining event and they're like I said but it would be too expensive and they said well just make it members only and then make that event ticketed so then I could have like a lower tier which is like do uh kind of like a buffet style for the lower tier where the tickets are cheaper and then do like a la carte where people choose the menu items a little higher tier and then have like a more close knit one where it's like the top hundred holders get to buy tickets to like a 12 or 24 course tasting. And I bring all my chef friends in and we cook like a crazy meal and do kind of like a board ape play conference, but then everyone's eating, you know what I mean? And then maybe um, in the future, I wanted to do like an animation when I'm sold out, I'll obviously have more money for like my animator friends and stuff. So like, I was thinking kind of like a short adventure time type of thing. Um, and then maybe I could play the premiere for all the members, like add that, so play the movie there, you know what I mean? And then be kind of like a film festival. So it was like all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, of course, like recipe books, private cooking lessons, um, the weekly spaces with all the chefs, and then just the monthly comic, the weekly airdrop, the animation, and then eventually, yeah, just like in-person cooking and maybe in-person cooking lessons if people, if it's that what they want to do, but, like, I think the the eating would be funner because everyone eats, you know, and not everyone like wants to cooking lessons. So I was just thinking like how I could scale it and have it be like, have a lot of like fun real world utility where like the, uh, I hope I'm saying his name right. The Tom Colicio, they just made like a pizza NFT where they want to make like, if you have the NFT, it's like a membership to go eat pizza for free at their like pizza thing or whatever, right? So like, I kind of wanted to, like I'm having a lot of fun with the art and people love the art, but I was like, I wanted to like integrate a lot of like value and utility into my dog so that one day it's like, someone can say like, Hey man, like I bought this one dog for, you know, $250 plus an $80 fee. So it's 330 bucks, but they got 52 and a few drops on the year. They got 12 comics. Maybe they got a few recipes. They got a few cooking master classes, and then they got access to, like a second generation I'm going to do where you have to have the first gen and then I want to do a third gen where you have to burn the second gen and own the first gen. So it's like, I want it to kind of like be like a membership gatekeeping thing where it's like, if you don't have that one dog, you're not getting all the perks and you're not getting into the next product. You know what I mean? So it's just like, I'm going to have, this one's a 10 K the second gen would be a five K that can be burnt. And then the third gen would be only two and a half thousand. So that would make if like all those, second gen ones got burned for the third gen then second and third gen would only be like a 2500 flow so it'd be like quite scarce you know what i mean mm -hmm. and then i'm gonna do them like obviously all different chef clothes and maybe a three-quarter angle or a side angle so i like i want to keep it fresh i'm not just going to use the same dog uh but i wanted to do like a mixed breed for my second gen and then a third gen would be like kind of like i want the dog to be like a transcended dog because i kind of have in the lore where they're getting stronger and stronger from eating like human grade food <laughs> and like having the love of all the humans and all the dogs around them or whatever. So like, I kind of want to make it like each series they're getting stronger to the point where like, they're like kind of like superhero dogs, but still chefs at the end. Maybe they have like enchanted swords and wings and magical Dragon Ball Z type auras or whatever. So it was like, I basically want to turn this into a whole, like a whole brand, you know, I want the banquets. I'll have the comic. I'll have three generations. I'll have in-person meeting. And then maybe just keep integrating my kind of like Facebook where, or not Facebook, sorry, TikTok, where like I'm doing different lives. Uh, like I usually just stream, I'll stream whatever. Sometimes I would just be going live, like me feeding my dogs or me cooking or me going out for dinner or me traveling. You know, I really want to like make it inclusive where I don't mind if people in my Discord are talking about like finance or gaming or anime. Like there's more room than just like people who are cooks and like dogs mm -hmm. for my project. You know what I mean? Like I want to know like everyone is welcome. I want to, you know, 
I'm here to like teach people the knowledge and I want to pass on what I've learned to, you know, the future generations and everyone else. And like, I think part of the NFT community that I found so great is everyone's like so loving and like willing to help each other like flourish. So I like kind of want to just like pay back the community in that way, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, those are some grand plans. Like obviously that's a long roadmap, yeah. you know, it'll take a long time, yeah. especially as a solo uh, artist. Like you don't really have a team beyond the development team. So that is, that is a yeah. big, uh, uh, a big endeavor, but like you gotta, you gotta shoot high, you know, like you're really going for something. You yeah, want to make something yeah. that people really want to be a part of. So that's really good. So where should we send people to uh, check out your project and uh, follow along with everything you're up to? Uh, if you want to check out my project, you just go to mint.shipwearedoge.com. Yeah. And I'll have that link in the, and then, in the show notes and everything. And then, yeah, at the bottom of the website, if you want to go, you can go to the project roadmap and then you can check out all my stuff. But yeah, pretty much like it's the comic and the airdrops, like I'm already doing myself. The only things that are like out of reach without me having a team are like the animation and the like physical meetups. Mm-hmm. Um, I can do those probably when I'm sold out because it's going to oh, cost yeah. like probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? <laughs> so it's just like, but the, the master classes, like I can ask my chef to go in on monday and say hey can you pick up whole unbutchered salmon because you need salmon for the menu anyways and he was already going to do that for tiktok anyways and then we'll record a 45 minute of you you know scaling the salmon and then butchering it and then boning it and then like turning into flats and stuff you know and so it's like that kind of i can do actually quite a bit of the stuff with the tools i already have it's just like the animation i would definitely need a team though and the physical meetups that would be the hardest one for sure because i would have to like hire like a hotel level of staff to yeah. like execute all that so that's why i'm like that's why when someone said just do a ticketed event and i was like yo that's that's a good idea because then i can help pay for it mm-hmm. but uh you know it's definitely like a five ten years forever years you know like as long as i'm alive you know i don't <laughs> see why i would stop yeah for you sure know? so you know like and that's what's like you know reassuring with people like sam and other people is like you know there's a lot of good artists in this community that might not have the marketing budget but it's like they're not going anywhere and they've released who they are. So they're not just going to randomly steal your money. Where like a lot of these products that people are putting a lot of faith in because they're trying to get a flip. And then they end up like the floor drops 85% when it's like a reveal and everything looks the same where the devs like took all the rares and then sold them on OpenSea. You know, like, I don't want to be that guy. Like, um, you know, I have morals and like, I want to make money one day so I can, you know, I'm giving 10% to Alzheimer's right now of my legacy collection. And eventually when I sell out, I want to give like a huge check to charity, but like, I don't want to do bad things to get to that point. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So it's just like, I'm in it for the long haul. I want to do it the right way. And I want to have fun doing it. You know what I mean? So For sure. And then I'm just going to make sure I'm transparent. Yeah. So in the short term, what are you most excited about? Like sort of right now? Um, right now, I'm just working on the Christmas comic. And I've been having a lot of fun, like doing the one-on-ones. I like after the launch, when I wasn't doing anything for like a few weeks, it kind of felt weird. I was just like, Oh, I just wish I was like creating again. Like Mm -hmm. all the marketing was getting kind of exhausting. The spaces were fun, but I was just like, I just want to be drawing, you know? So it was just like, of course I'll be working on the second and third gen when I sell out. But in the meantime, like I want to just grow my community network and just art like based on the comics and the airdrops. And then, you know, maybe like a little bit of collabs here and there. Um, and like, just like, maybe I'll make some one-on-ones for fun and like release them. I like, I did a celebrity one of like Gary Vee as a dog. Like I, that was like something else I was dabbling with. Like I might just do all the celebrities as dogs just for fun mm-hmm. and like sell those as one-on-ones. Cause I don't want to stop doing my one-on-ones. I kind of like want to be like Sam where like, I want my general project, my comic, my airdrops, and then my one-on-ones. I don't want to just like be stuck being like, oh, I made my 10K now. So now I'm never going to do anything till my until I'm sold out and then I'll work on my roadmap. I'm like, that's bullshit, man. Like what if you people don't sell it for two years, who are going to want to see some sort of extra value. You know what I mean? So yeah, for sure. I'm just going to focus on just continue putting out work. And like, that's what I do best. Like I've never been like the kind of guy that, you know, is like, I'm usually like top 85% of the class, but like, it's just the hours I put in where it's just like, there was like uh it was like David Goggins. Someone was like, dude, why do you work so hard? And you just said, cause you're not, so you just like, you just, <laughs> You just put in as many hours as you can and eventually you're just going to pass people just from like pure hard work and determination. That's kind of like what my focus has been. Um, and I'm just going to just keep working. But honestly, it's like 
people are like, oh, you put in such long hours, but dude, it's so fun. I don't care. It's, it doesn't even feel like work. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? For it's sure. like to get paid whenever someone buys a dog. I'm like, I'm so honored. I'm just like, dude, thank you. Like, this is fucking awesome. Like who would buy like my art? And, you know, I was thinking like in my, like to myself and then like, Ed, the more people I talk to, they're like, dude, your art's actually good. They're like, don't <laughs> like, don't beat yourself up. Like your art. Cause you know, in school, maybe the teachers would like tell my, tell me my style is flat or, or something where like now that like pop art or cartoony style is like what profile pictures are all about. Cause like, and then I like, when I first started sharing it on Twitter, it went from like teachers being like, oh, your start's flat, uh, or your style's flat because I like drawing anime and you have uh, really thick line work. And now when people are like, oh, I love the thick line work and I love how it's flat, I'm just like, what? Yeah. So it went from like, you know, the teachers kind of saying that was like a too cartoony of a style to like people wanted the cartoony style. And that's what really like started blowing up on the chef dog was just how much positive feedback I get from it. And that's really encouraging. So sure. it makes me want to keep going. You know what I mean? Be sure to head on over to chefboyardoge.com where you can find uh, Richie's project and the roadmap and everything else that he talked about. Again, that's chefboyardoge.com. And if you're enjoying the show, be sure to subscribe on YouTube or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening right now. And my version, my favorite version is the YouTube version. So if you subscribe, give a little thumbs up, that really means a lot because I'm trying to reach as many people as I can with this show. So thanks again. And that'll do it for this week. Again, I'm Jeff Saris. This has been Starting Now, and I'll see you next time.